from the Northeast, Jim Chisholm. He is an engineering technologist for the Highway Construction Services Division of the Nova Scotia Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. Well, thank you everybody for having me here. Like Stephanie, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come out and uh, speak to you. Oregon's a beautiful part of the world and I look forward to seeing it from 30,000 feet. A quick update on the Northeast during uh, Pavement Preservation Partnership and then I'll uh, go into the agency report. So the Northeastern Pavement Preservation Partnership, who we are? We're 13 state agencies and one lonely provincial agency, Nova Scotia. We'd like to get New Brunswick involved so we can uh, fill in that little gap between us and Maine, but haven't had any uh, luck getting them in yet. And we also have 12-page uh, pavement regional industry members. And uh, if you all know Scott Nazer over there, he's one of our uh, industry reps and a board member. I've been with the Northeastern Partnership since 2007, and I've missed one in 2008 when my daughter was born. So I've gone to every one of them since. So our mission, like yours, is to provide an ongoing regional forum for pavement preservation principles and to promote and implement the benefits of pavement preservation, share and exchange improvements in research, design, specifications, materials, and construction practices. It's quite, uh, quite valuable to have uh, contacts throughout the uh, United States and in Canada. So several times we've uh, had to contact our agencies. Uh, Vermont, pavement management engineer for Vermont came up uh, a few years ago to talk about his uh, experience with ultra-thin bonded wearing course. We were trying to get that program off the ground. Never did. The contractors didn't want to take to it. So, but interesting with that, he, uh, he actually couldn't get permission to come up, so he took vacation. <laughs> so we owe him one. But he's since retired, so I still keep in touch with him, though. He's a real good guy. Now, our task force groups aren't quite as uh, intense as what I just heard from uh, Stephanie. We have uh, three task force groups, but we haven't met in a few years, and uh, really have to figure out why, because we've kind of let it slide. One was on uh, project database and promotion, marketing and public relations. We have a, on the website, we have a, uh, a sidebar where we collect preservation uh, information, and we have a database to showcase pavement preservation projects. Now, it's hard to get people to upload to that, and I think the last time was 2011, so there's not many projects in there. It's basically just you, you pick a project that you're working on that's interesting, you throw a few, few lines of text in there and some photos just to show, show what's going on. But that's something we have to bring back to life as well. Special provisions and pavement preservation specifications. We've been collecting uh, special provisions from all the agencies and putting them on the, on the website as well. And research. We've been reviewing the TSP2 research roadmap. Now I've noticed uh, on our website we said it says we're uh, reaching out to the Rocky Mountain West to discuss combining efforts. I don't know if that's ever been done. Um, haven't heard. So on our website we have our video library where with the highlighted links you can go in and pick any any of our um, annual meetings and you can look at all the uh, presentations. Also we have our uh, special provisions uh, folder where if you go in you can click on uh, each treatment that we have and every state and province will have uh, our special provisions. The one thing we did create was a uh, specifications matrix. I don't know if you can see that very well but we have uh, a contact person for every agency and what we have for treatments either a special provision or a standard. So what I'd like to see is maybe a, a link so you could just click on each one of these and it would bring it up. We'll have to work on that. Might be something for next year. Now at the meeting we do something a little different than what you guys have done I believe. In the morning we have a agency only session. So it's uh, before the conference starts at one o'clock all the agencies get together. Nobody else is allowed. We, we bar them and we just have an open discussion. It's not recorded. No notes, no minutes. Or you can take notes, obviously, to find out what people are talking about. But uh, I apologize, this slide's a little misleading. The picture, uh, no one's given a presentation there. <laughs> the rest is pretty accurate. No, it's, a, it's quite a good discussion. Uh, we just talk everything from every kind of preservation treatment, how contractors are. It's, a, it's quite well received, and we're going to keep doing it. We started it last year, so this, this year will be the second, second annual. Also, for uh, November, we're going to have an online conference call. Same thing, except this one will have anybody that wants to from the 2018 group. It's uh, roughly about two hours duration. We have, a, again, agency and industry representation, and it's, an, again, an open discussion. So it's kind of nice to tie up the year for your uh, 
everything's fresh in your mind, so it, it ties it up, and then we go off into the winter time, and in May we meet, April, May, we meet again and do the same thing over again to start the conference. So it's kind of a nice uh, thing to do. Also, we have sent, this year, two agency members have attended the uh, AASHTO Maintenance Committee meeting in North Carolina, and they will be providing an update at the 2019 conference, and we will be attending again the same conference in 2019. I'm not sure when that's going to be, but we'll uh, we usually ask any of the agency members to vote on if they want to send somebody, and we get some nominees. Uh, this year, the conference was held in Mystic, Connecticut in May, and we had uh, 128 total attendees. In 2016, we voted to send three agency members, not just two. So that's, a, that's quite a help. But unfortunately, New York, Mass, Rhode Island wouldn't allow their uh, reps to attend, even though they're very close to Connecticut, like for the closest of anyone, and they weren't allowed to come. And 2019 conference is going to be held in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, but we haven't decided the dates. We're talking April, but we haven't uh, nailed it down yet. Keep looking at the website, and if you feel like attending, feel free. Now I'm going to slide seamlessly into the Nova Scotia agency update. There's a nice view of uh, the Cabot Trail in Cape Breton Island. So we'll talk a little bit about the Nova Scotia Highway Network. Department of Transportation is responsible for 90% of the public roadways in Nova Scotia. Also 4,100 bridges, 23,000 kilometers, ro 23 km 23, kilometers of roads, which roughly 8,700 miles of paved and 5,600 miles of unpaved roads. 100 series highways, are a lesser version of your interstates. I think our highest AADT is like 45,000. In, in close to the Halifax area, that's the capital of uh, the province. Trans-Canada Highway runs from New Brunswick to the end of Cape Breton, which continues off to uh, Newfoundland. There are trunks. There, uh, some of the trunks were the highway system until they were upgraded, and they, some of them run parallel to the highway, 100, 100 series highways. Uh, you have 1,500 uh, centerline miles of those, and routes are a little lesser than those, 1,900 centerline miles. Uh, we didn't put the local roads in there because that would just blow the map up. <laughs> there, there's a lot of those that we have to maintain. The province is broken up into four districts, each with its own uh, construction managers and uh, maintenance managers, which report to the, the central office, uh, the chief engineer and the executive directors. We also have a published five-year capital plan, and in that plan there's a blurb about pavement preservation, which is kind of nice. Uh, I put a link to it there, but I probably won't open it. I probably won't be able to get back to the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's highlighted there at uh, pavement preservation is cost effective. Spending a dollar on pavement preservation before a paved road is 15 years old can eliminate or delay having to spend 6 to $14 in rehab or reconstruction when the pavement surface has failed. We're trying to get that out there to the public why pavement preservation is uh, key. It's uh, kind of hard sometimes, but this, this helps. Our 2018-19 funding, that's still part of the five-year plan. Uh, I've highlighted the most important part to us is the asphalt and resurfacing, which is $101.5 million. We've actually started, a, the new government promised to build highway bypasses for some of the less safe sections of road where two-lane, two-way with some limited climbing lanes. A lot of, uh, there's been a lot of accidents and fatali fatalities in these sections. So we are uh, basically reconstructing, building new highways. We've got a whole new group for that with a, with a director, a construction manager, They've brought project managers on board, and uh, we're working on that now. And they, uh, they plan to have them completed within seven years. Two main preservation treatments are microsurfacing and seal coats. And uh, the interesting part of that is they're both warranty spec. The micro has a two-year warranty, the seal coats are one. For pricing, the micro runs about 625 a square meter. Uh, seal coat type A, 550 a square meter. Type B is 670 a square meter. So it's, it's not the cheapest, but it's what we have. We also do quite a bit of partial and full depth reclamation, cold in place with expanded asphalt, usually 80 to 100 millimeters depth, and uh, we add Portland cement for a little strength, which works quite, uh, quite nicely. And uh, the full depth is, again, expanded asphalt, runs anywhere from 150 to 250 millimeters, and again, we add Portland cement. I know this isn't really preservation, but it's important to bring up that we, uh, we've been doing this since uh, 1996, I believe, and it's quite a good process. Here's a uh, quick slide of a, of a job we did. Uh, I don't know if you can see the yellow text. This was a 2017 full depth job to 150 millimeters with a two lift overlay. The interesting part, it was full depth recycled in 2003 to 150 millimeters with a single lift overlay. Uh, the lifespan of this, it didn't last very long. It cracked pretty, pretty quickly after it was paved and it was crack sealed quite a bit. 
but we thought it would be interesting to process, reprocess, uh, process jobs, and it uh, came out very nice. I mean, we joked, after the processing, you can see it looks better than a lot of paving that some of the contractors have done. And uh, it rides beautifully. It's a really nice job. Quick table of our uh, 17 preservation treatments. We did four micro jobs, five seal coat type A, three seal coat type B, four cold in place recycled, and three full depths. In 2018, pretty similar, five micro jobs, four and four of the seal coat A and B, five cold in place recycled, and one full depth. Full depth job hasn't started yet. Uh, the contractor's way behind schedule on their job, and uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. They're talking end of October, early November now for this project, and if you guys are aware of when you do recycling, we try to finish them in September. Something tells me they're going to cancel that job and just pave it. I don't know. It doesn't fill me with confidence. So we'll talk a little bit about microsurfacing, a little more in-depth. That's on a, applied on our 100 series highways only, and we do rut fill, scratch course, and a wearing course. Now, as it's a warranty, the mix design is by the contractor, and we have a QA consultant that reviews this, so if there's any issues with it, they'll let us let us know and tell the contractor. Uh, again, two-year warranty spec, uh, five, year, five to seven year service life, and it's measured in square meters. So our pavement management system, we run the Stantec uh, system. It's uh, currently for our, only on our 100 series highways. We look at the pavement quality index, rutting, age of highway to dictate the treatment selections. And uh, we include all the ARAN data from the, uh, the rut data from the ARAN in our contract documents so the contractor can see what, where to put the rut fill and a scratch course if needed. And a rut box is used in the wheel tracks over 10 millimeters. They pretty well always use con rollers anyway. We don't dictate that they have to, but it's in our spec that they may use them. Now here's a project I'll show you from last year. This was a section of highway that was a new construction in 2011. It was a bypass of a two-lane, two-way highway, like I spoke of earlier, through the town of Antigonish, where I grew up. And uh, the micro was applied in 2017. It was uh, 12 miles of all the travel lanes, ramps, and six roundabouts. It's always a joke in Antigonish. If you leave Victoria, BC, they say, how do you get to Antigonish? They say, just leave Victoria, take the Transcanda Highway until you hit the first set of lights. Because it was four sets of traffic lights on the Transcanda Highway in, in town there. And uh, this bypass is quite nice. And this will continue. There's another section we're uh, working on now that continues past, and there's another section before this section that uh, we're working on to uh, bypass. So it's going to be a beautiful project when it's finished. You might see, too, if you apply micro on a, this is a reddish-pink granite aggregate. When you have a failure, it really shows up. So what happened here is about a 200-foot section of micro that just wore in the middle of the highway. We're not sure why it happened, but the contractor is going to look into it and repair it. And that photo was taken in May of 2018. I was down through there. Here's one of the roundabouts, and you can see in the turning, turning motions where the uh, micro has started to uh, erode away, and there's a... Quite a massive crack. That has nothing to do with the micro. So that's another part that will have to be repaired under warranty. For the most part, our micros, uh, they do last the full seven years. We had a discussion about making it a three-year warranty, and the contractors weren't too happy with that. They said, well, three-year warranty on a seven-year, five to seven-year uh, project, why bother doing it? Well, we're uh, going to look into that further. Our seal coats are applied to non-100 series highways, 100 series asphalt and gravel roads. And again, the mix design is by contractor, reviewed by our uh, consultant. These are one-year warranty with a four, four to seven-year service life, and again, measured in square meters. I know uh, we had a discussion in May that uh, I think seal coats are, nobody calls them seal coats, but us in Texas, I think. Everyone else calls them chip seals, right? That's something we should look at again, too. We've got to change our spec. We don't, we're different enough. <laughs> so the Type A is a single seal coat, polymer modified emulsified asphalt, uh, three-quarter inch minus stone, and we apply a fog seal just after to protect from plow damage. The Type B is a double seal coat applied mainly to gravel roads with an emulsion applied and three quarter inch stone and then applied another half inch stone on top of that and then fog seal applied. Now some of these seal coat projects, I get called out to look at a warranty review of, uh, this is one project, uh, there's two slides, I could have more but for the sake of time. This was done in 2016. It was a single seal coat applied over a double seal coat from several years back. And you can see quite a bit of flushing and bleeding on it. The contractor basically said, no, it's not flushing, that's just blackening, he said. They, they hunted me down at a conference, and I wrote a report on this to the engineer, and he shared it with the contractor. <coughs> but, I don't know, it looks like flushing to me. And uh, I went back in June. It got in the, it's gotten a little worse. That is a uh, Canadian dollar coin. It's about an inch in diameter. If you can stand a coin up in the liquid, 
I think that's flushed, right? The girl at the coffee shop, when I went to buy a coffee after this, kind of looked at it funny. She was like, what's on this uh, coin? <laughs> I actually stuck to the ground when I was taking this photo. The last I heard from the project engineer, they are going to come back and uh, do a repair. I think they finally realized that they weren't right. Maybe we were correct for once. It's a bit of a battle sometimes. When you do have a failure, they'll fight tooth and nail. They'll bring in their experts to say why it's not their problem. This, this project had a lot of uh, subgrade failures, which we owed up to. It's like, okay, we'll, we'll go with the repair on that. We'll fix that if you guys will repair the, uh, the flushing. And they still were... Uh, pretty hesitant on doing that. Let's talk a little bit about the warranty acceptance. So in our spec, we, we require that initial acceptance is based on specified criteria. Any area not meeting spec, such as uh, coins standing up in the middle of the road, is to be repaired by the contractor. Any repairs are to be warrantied for one year. At the end of the uh, warranty period, we review again for, uh, for final acceptance. And if, it's finally, if it is accepted, then they uh, get their security deposit back. Generally, the uh, project engineers will, some, some will do, do it themselves, or we'll call uh, myself or a coworker of mine to go out and do a quick uh, review, and if we see any issues, we, uh, we let them know. And then it's on their end to follow up with the repairs or, or just pay it out. Some of them just pay it out and let the job go. Contractor responsibility, they're allowed, if they submit a safety plan for approval and they have a letter of good standing with the Workers' Compensation Board, they can bid on contracts. They're responsible for training their own crews. Again, all their mix design and materials must meet specifications. Uh, their QC data is to be supplied within 24 hours to the engineer. And if there are repairs, they're responsible for that and any associated costs. So what we could do better? Inspector training. We have a lot of inspectors that are uh, getting up there in years. Somebody told me that the average age of our inspectors is 65, I think, and uh, that's pretty well retirement age. And we really don't see many younger uh, inspectors coming along behind them. We did offer inspector training. We do that every spring, but we haven't done it in years. It just got dropped. And we're talking about bringing it, bringing it back, but we haven't uh, filled any positions for uh, the trainers to do that. So hopefully that's going to come back next year or so because uh, it's, it's sorely needed. Quality assurance testing. We really don't do any assurance testing. We just rely on their QC data. Candidate selection, we're getting better at that. We, uh, we do a lot of coring and boring now on our, our roads. And we look at the subgrade, look at the core thicknesses for, uh, for roads. I mean, if the uh, rut depths, things like that. Seal coats, we should do a better job of picking the, picking the gravel roads that they uh, do because we don't do a lot of uh, maintenance to those roads and a lot of potholes. We, we really should have them uh, pick better ones, I guess. Inspection during construction, again, sometimes the project engineers just throw their, whoever they have on, on the staff for uh, training. Who do, they may not know much about uh, war micro or, or, or ship seals. They just kind of walk along and make sure they basically check tonnages and areas. Again, like I mentioned before, we have to pay attention to warranty timelines a little better. Some, some jobs, they just keep going on until the contractor says, hey, where's my uh, bid bond? Oh, yeah, we didn't get that back. <laughs> Public awareness is key, too. We're, uh, we're trying. Like I said, with the five-year plan, we actually we're, we're trying to get the message out about uh, why pavement preservation is important. But I think that's uh, everywhere. That's pretty much it for me. If you have any questions, I'll, uh, I'll try to take them. Your microsurfacing uh, process for doing the rut fill and the scratch course and then the final lift. How, did, how long have you been doing that and how uh, um, and how did you develop that procedure and get it to is it, and, and how yeah, successful do you feel it is for you? Started before I started with the department. Can't really answer how it was developed, but uh, it does work quite well. If the ruts are too deep, we don't uh, micro. We do a mill and fill and patch the bad rutted areas. Uh, the rut box, they put the rut box in, they roll it, and then they put the scratch course down, and it, uh, it does work very well. We do some uh, emergency repairs too. Some of our roads can rut very, ba very badly with studded tire wear and uh, heavy truck traffic. Like we'll do a single lane instead of both lanes because obviously the, uh, the right-hand lane will rut a lot more than the passing lane. It, uh, it works well. All right. Thank you very much. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.